This is the Wrestling Fan Wrestling Show. Let me in. To understand the initial impact of the character Bray Wyatt in WWE, you have to consider the time in which he was introduced. Characters generally had a homogeny about them. The most distinguishable characteristics person to person would revolve around ethnicities. In that era, there was also huge familiarity with the roster also. Acts who seemingly have been around forever with little character development, being involved in high profile spots on a consistent basis. Every now and again, fans would receive a lifeline, something to grip their teeth into. Each one acting as a bolt of lightning into a stagnant, lifeless product. These moments more often than not tended to be mere flashes of brilliance that sucked you back in as a fan before leaving you burnt when they ultimately fizzled out and failed to live up to expectations. So why would one choose to get invested in storylines again if they're generally left dissatisfied? Because when wrestling is good, it is to a wrestling fan the finest form of entertainment in the world. How much of that is tied up in nostalgia? A lot, I reckon. Some of the best memories of my childhood are playing with my wrestling figures, recreating moments I had seen on television. I had VHS tapes of Survivor Series 89, The Great American Bash 1990 and WrestleMania 8 that I watched on repeat. Then something happened in 1996. Weekly episodic television was pumped into my veins in the form of WCW Nitro and WWE Raw. My feeble six-year-old Irish brain could not consume enough of it. I distinctly remember the build-up to WrestleMania 12. I vividly recall Rey Mysterio being thrown like a lawn dart by Kevin Nash. And I remember the introduction of One Mankind. The videos of a man in a mask playing with a rat in a dark room while shrieking and pulling out his hair just mesmerised me. I wasn't scared, I was confused. Wrestling made it generally clear to children who was good and who was bad. <laughs> it's how the business worked. You wanted to see the good guy shut them out of the bad guy, so you paid for the privilege. Mankind looked like a traditional bad guy, but he said sad things. Yeah, on the eighth day, God created me. Maybe he should have slept that day too. <laughs> to top it off, he used to tell me to have a nice day. I was intrigued. I talked about it in school. I wanted to know more about this lad. This was not a single bolt of lightning, no initial shock. No, this built up for weeks and weeks until his inevitable debut. The man was unlike anything I had ever experienced before. Nuance. Not everything was black and white, or just good and bad. We all have stories that make us who we are, however ugly they may be. And this brings me to 2013 and the introduction of the Wyatt family. <laughs> 2013 started with John Cena winning the Royal Rumble once again before going on to headline WrestleMania 29 against The Rock for the second consecutive year in a row even after the original match was built as a once-in-a-lifetime event. WWE went the exact same route as they did before. May seen Brock Lesnar and Triple H, two characters audience are wholly familiar with, headlining an Extreme Rules pay-per-view in a so-and-so steel cage match. Everything just seems so dull and lifeless. A complete over-reliance on the same people we have watched succeed for years and years. However, it wasn't long after the Extreme Rules event, that I, along with the rest of us, got to catch the first glimpse of a group of grimy men from the bayou. Hey, you want to say something really scary? <laughs> In just over a minute, we were told partial truths, offered an excuse as to our problems in society and told by a charismatic leader. We're coming. Run. <laughs> Was he a good guy or a bad guy? In wrestling terms, a face or a heel. Our collective curiosities had been aroused. It was no mere coincidence that this came at a time when wrestling was in need of a major upgrade. Was this new gang or faction going to solve all our problems? We had no answers, but we wanted to find out. As the weeks passed, anticipation rose. I tuned in for over three hours of programming to get whatever little trickle of info I could. I didn't find these grubby men particularly cool. I 
did not see myself in them. They were just interesting. Sure, they had a message that resonated in some ways, people being blinded by what's really going on in the world, but what was Bray Wyatt really after? To help people, thus being a face, or did he want to exploit their vulnerabilities, <laughs> thus being a heel? What did you notice about this entrance? Two things stick out for me. Number one, the subdued nature of the entrance. When you think of WWE in your mind, you think of the pageantry, the lights, the pyro, the glitz, the glam. This was the complete antithesis of that. A singular light is all that your eyes can follow when the song tries to lull you into a false sense of security. Unnerving and soothing, real feelings. His pace is slow, allowing me to think about every single thing he said before his arrival. We live in a world where society has poisoned the souls of men. And this brings me on to my second thought. I only noticed recently when looking back on everything for this, the man never blinked. Although this may seem innocuous, this plays into your subconscious mind. His eyes were open. Intentional? No doubt. You see, sociopaths are known to have intense stares and rarely blink. The definition of a sociopath is a person who consistently shows no regard for right or wrong and ignores the rights and feelings of others. This was Bray telling us he cannot be trusted without saying a word. Without one utterance, his brothers, not followers, attacked Kane. In shades similar to Mankind circa 1996 who went after The Undertaker, Bray Wyatt chose Taker's brother Kane, subliminally sending messages that once his family get rid of the devil's favourite demon, Bray could be the new malevolent force in WWE. In truth, Kane had lost his luster many moons ago, at this stage, he's been around for 16 years, so as a fan, I still had the ambiguity of what Wyatt's real intentions were supposed to be. I mean, they wreaked havoc with their attacks on wrestlers, who, like Kane, had no real connection with the fans anymore, the likes of Art Truth, Justin Gabriel, and 3MB. The three-man air guitar band. Yeah, wrestling can be the worst at times. So, he was ridding me of my problems with the product. I wanted this to succeed. He told Kane to follow the buzzards. The buzzard means death and rebirth, new vision and letting go. This was the character we wanted. He was the eater of worlds, as Bray proclaimed. I am Bray Wyatt, the eater of worlds. Was he the eater of world wrestling entertainment? Previously, I spoke about the production of WWE. Well, sometimes this is to the detriment. It can come across as hokey. Cameras where cameras should not be. Buckle up, Teddy. To be fair, it's not solely a problem with WWE. WCW had Robocop show up one time. But just silliness, or wrestle crap as fans would call it. It just does not seem to have a place in wrestling. To fight their way through a field of zombies. Yep. For this art form to work, collectively, we all have to temporarily allow oneself to believe something that is not true. Suspend our disbelief that these people were fighting each other. We have built a world in our mind where this takes place and we hate having our understanding of the world insulted. I could do a whole video essay on the need for consistency in wrestling one day, but that's the gist of my belief for now. So how does this tie into the Wyatt family? For Bray Wyatt's first ever match where he needed to be considered a force, he faced off with Kane in a ring of fire match. <sighs> this is where the ring was surrounded by an inferno. Wyatt connected it to Icarus and Kane's whole backstory that was burnt in a fire as a child which turned him into a monster. Wyatt argued that it would ultimately be the flames that were his undoing. He tried his best, his words made sense, however the match itself left a lot to be desired. In the end Bray won and the Wyatt family carried Kane off. I'll fill you in on that later. It was just anticlimactic. We did not get to see Bray's aggression because in reality the fire completely restricted the match. A character such as Wyatt didn't need fancy looking gimmicks. The man came across as real as it gets and that in itself is special. Especially in a world where a man is known as the Funkasaurus. 
I compared it to the first time I watched a movie known as House of a Thousand Corpses. Now I saw that movie after I experienced its sequel The Devil's Rejects first. I remember being captivated by the second movie for a time period because these very evil family members came across as very, very relatable and human, which is a sincere shock to the system. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I seeked out a copy of its precursor for months before I finally laid my hands on it, and after much anticipation, I finally got it. Ah, there it is. And it set me up for a worse disappointment than the Mortal Kombat 2 movie. Mother. You're alive. Too bad you will die. Mortal Kombat! The realistic approach was abandoned towards the end in favor of whatever the f this is. <laughs> why did that nonsense need to happen? Hey, she owes me 14 bucks. Get, get down here. And why did Bray need a ring of fire in his first ever match in WWE? Ray continued on his path of righteousness despite that minor indiscretion. For me, he was a wordsmith that sucked you into whatever he was saying, if you let him. An orator with a serious message that had a sweetness to his face. That is scary. That is the true face of fear. What was needed, though, was more followers. That was expected. The family to grow as cults seem to do. With the carrying off of Kane's lifeless body to the back, it was thought that he would return a changed man under the spell of Wyatt. <laughs> However, he did return, but to combat the Wyatts. Before taking off his mask the next night and donning a suit and tie, the big red machine became a part of a corporate machine. Wyatt talked about the rebirth. However, why bring him back to go against the Wyatts initially under his own guise, only to change that attack the next night? In the end, Stephanie McMahon held Kane's head. It should have been Bray. In the meantime, the family had turned their attention to Kane's old tag team partner, Daniel Bryan. Now, Bryan, much like Bray, was quite dissimilar to the prototypical WWE superstar. After finally reaching the top of the business by winning the top title against John Cena, Bryan had it cruelly taken away from him in the same night, thus breaking fans' hearts worldwide. Look, wrestling is like any form of fiction. The good guy can't always win. For a competitive story, you need ups and downs, I get that. But this felt different. This felt in spite of fans. One could argue that was the intention. After all, there was a storyline based around authority figures. Those authority figures were called, wait for it, The Authority. So they were running the show much to the fans' displeasure and doing what they deemed best for business. While it could be argued, it won't hold water. WWE, or The Authority, had Randy Orton, a mainstay and a headliner for nearly a decade, and he was the main champion of the company, with a returning headliner in Batista scheduled to win the Royal Rumble, thus setting up a WrestleMania main event. Now, we did not like that one bit. Once again, WrestleMania will be catered towards casual fans who may recognize these names of old instead of being used to establish new stars. Wyatt tried to recruit Bryan and was successful for three weeks with the fan support of Brian proven to be too big for the top brass to ignore. The storyline got abandoned with a triumphant Brian getting one over the Wyatt family. Once again, Bray's plans were foiled with his attempts to convert another member of the roster. However, WWE had an ace up their sleeve. The Shield. Now, The Shield were a three-man group of badass mercenaries who, like the Wyatt family, gave the WWE Universe a much-needed boost in confidence in the product. I spoke previously about receiving lightning bolts. This was the company's flash of brilliance in 2012, when they debuted at Survivor Series. It was up to WWE to capture that lightning in a bottle, and they certainly seemed to do that when the two factions came face to face. Oh boy. Listen to that reaction. Once again, without saying a word. We now had a showdown to look forward to. And it was class. That night, on the first three-on-three -three confrontation at Elimination Chamber, was everything wrestling gets right. Just lads slapping the heads off each other, showing incredible chemistry to produce a battle that outshone everything else on the card. Surely this was to be the defining feud of 2014. 
Think of the combinations and the various different match types we could get over the year with a full-blown war going on. However, we didn't get that. We got a month to wet our whistle before each side went off on their own merry way. Think about this chapter. WWE had two amazing storylines in Daniel Bryan and The Shield vs The Wyatt Family that they actively did not want to pursue. Why? Because it was WrestleMania season, baby! WrestleMania is known as the showcase of the immortals, and for good reason. It is for a wrestling fan our Christmas, bringing us so many happy moments throughout our life. I genuinely remember my years by WrestleMania main events. 2001, oh that was Mania 17, Rock and Austin. 96, Mania 12, Bret and Shawn, Iron Man match. Mania 24 with Edge and Undertaker was 2008 because WrestleMania 20 was 2004. And 10 years on from 20 was 30 which happened to be Bray Wyatt's debut on the grandest stage of them all. The person Bray would go up against, perennial Mania main eventer John Cena. Cena won his first world title nine years before at the 21st edition, 2005, and has been on top ever since. The safe fans rejected him during that time would be an understatement. To be honest, this was a whole other docu-series in itself. Essentially, his character never grew. He was the same jort-wearing superhero year in and year out, preaching hustle, loyalty and respect. Once one set of kids grew out of it, another stepped right in. It all just came across as ingenuine. So it would make sense that the Wyatt family would be set out to destroy John Cena's legacy by proving him to be a villain. It's really interesting when you hear Michael Cole set out what Bray's intentions were for the match. Wyatt didn't care about winning, he wanted to just open everyone's eyes to the evil within. A prophet in his own mind, sacrificing himself. What an interesting premise. Would the Cena nation be exposed and thus ended up converted thanks to the mastery of Bray's plans? From the result it would seem the answer is no. Bray accomplished nothing. Cena overcame all the odds once again, sticking to his values and having his hands raised come the end of the match. You almost have to admire the stubbornness. Look, WWE did make some big calls at that mania by having the crowd-pleasing Daniel Bryan win the world title and the shocking decision of Brock Lesnar defeating The Undertaker, thus ending a 21-0 streak. But if the torch was being passed, why did it not go all the way? John Cena was coming to the end of his run, did he really need that win? Did Bray just fail again? The two would continue their feud, Cena was voted by the WWE Universe into a 3 on 1 match against the family, a match that he would merge victorious from via DQ. Elsewhere a children's choir tried to then symbolically hammer home the point that people indeed turned on him. Bray obtained a victory inside a steel cage at Extreme Rules with help from Harper and Rowan and a young boy. This is where it starts to turn for me in general of this iteration of Bray Wyatt. The lights went down, and when it looked like Cena was going to win, they came back. With a young boy dressed in a black robe appearing and singing to John Cena in a demonic voice. It was silly, and it was less than convincing. More importantly, it was uninteresting. By the time the two had their blow-off match at Payback, the heat had died down. Cena had beaten all three members of the Wyatt family on numerous occasions and had his hand raised when it came to an end. Cena then went on to become the world champion a few weeks later for the 15th time, where it was evident that the fans wanted out with the old and in with something new. Wyatt meanwhile meandered and within the space of a year failed to live up to the excitement that was originally garnered when he said he was here. The whole world was in his hands, but the universe was under the control of Vince McMahon, who just did not know what to do with an emerging star. The same could be said for Dean Ambrose. Ambrose was one of the members of The Shield before the group was split. He was, like Bray, an unconventional performer who fans got behind before eventually becoming apathetic towards. And every time that I look at you, I can't help but see my own deranged reflection glaring back at me. Eventually Ambrose would go on to leave and become John Moxley in rival promotion AEW. He'd pen a book and had this to say about his time with the company. The whole time from the time I came back to about the beginning of the year, 
I knew I was leaving, but I was like pissed about it. I wasn't like excited to leave yet. I was like bitter about it. Cause I'm like, I can't believe they're gonna make me leave. They're gonna make me walk away from all this money. I can't believe that. Can we not just write one good storyline? Can we not write one good promo? Does everything have to be fucking stupid? Does everything have to make me look like an idiot? Like for fuck's sake, you're gonna make me walk away from all this fucking money. Cause it's not like I didn't want that money. That was my sentiments exactly about the company as well. Why does everything have to be so stupid? Not so much about the money side of things. <laughs> what happens next? What happens next, you tell me? The powers to be split up Wyatt from Harper and Rowan, setting them free from one another. Luke Harper is set free. Uh, Eric Rowan is set free. Before Wyatt returned by revealing a hologram emanating from a lantern in a Hell in a Cell match between Ambrose and Seth Rollins. The two would go on to have a TLC match that was finished when Ambrose grabbed the TV monitor only to cause a small explosion due to not unplugging it, thus allowing Wyatt to gain an advantage of the mid-match electrocution and win. Shocking. This would steamroll into a miracle on 34th Street Fight, a Christmas-themed hardcore match. Just what I wanted. And then finally an ambulance match. That was some paragraph to write. The story between a Wyatt reborn and a reckless lunatic like Ambrose could have been psychological and violent, but instead we got cartoony and camp. That is Bray Wyatt's almost sacred rocking chair. Michael Keaton's Batman versus George Clooney's Batman. I freeze, I'm Batman. No one anywhere picks the one with bat nipples, ever. You're lucky that paragraph was just a condensed version. I lived through it. Bray was now well into his tenure on the main roster and has rarely come out of his programs looking like a massive threat, despite still maintaining his menace. It was a case of the boy who cried wolf one too many times. There was always a sense though of being let down by the company as opposed to anything he done. After a strong showing at the Royal Rumble, Manny wondered what Bray's direction would be now without his family behind him. The choice was made clear at Fastlane when the lights went down, druids appeared and a casket foreshadowed an appearance of The Undertaker, who had not been seen since Brock Lesnar was dubbed the man to break his undefeated WrestleMania streak. A swerve was on the cards though, as it was not The Undertaker that emerged from the casket, but Bray Wyatt making the destination at the end of the road to WrestleMania evident for both Wyatt and Taker, a clash of generations. Wyatt showed his prowess on the mic by carrying the feud, allowing Undertaker to stay in the shadows and make his return at WrestleMania 31. The anticipation was real, both larger-than-life characters searching for redemption after their failures the year previous. Could this be the turning point of Wyatt finally winning the big one and being seen as the successor to the crown held by The Undertaker since his Survivor Series debut in 1990? Since that day, Undertaker had competed at 22 WrestleManias and won 21, defeating big name after big name time and time again. That's how the streak was established, consistently allowing the character to flourish. Wyatt came across as the natural successor, not to the streak specifically, but to the legacy of The Undertaker. The match took place in broad daylight, which seemed to me like a bit of a juxtaposition to the characters that they both portrayed. However, the real talking point was that once again, Bray Wyatt failed. The redemption was held for The Undertaker as opposed to the young upstart. At less than 30 years of age, Wyatt has now failed once again. The broader narrative certainly helped The Undertaker as he went after the man who defeated the streak, the beast incarnate Brock Lesnar, while Wyatt meandered before once again realigning himself with his brothers that he previously set free. He targeted the golden boy, Roman Reigns, at Money in the Bank before the two embarked on a feud for the summer, a rivalry in which Roman emerged victorious. However, Wyatt for the first time in two years added to his flock with a full-time member in the form of Braun Strowman. This is what we wanted to see. It was thought that Strowman was being groomed to take on The Undertaker at WrestleMania 32, which at the time seemed quite laughable. But to get there, Bray had to once again cross paths with The Undertaker and Kane, the Brothers of Destruction. The older guard once again were favoured instead of establishing the new stars, a problem that was endemic within WWE over the years. 
reliance on the drawing power of the aging superstars with a failure to plan for the future? How can we as fans get behind any act, knowing that ultimately it's going to be undone by someone we previously supported? This was seen previously in WCW, creating an elephant-proof glass ceiling in which the undercar can never break through. Steve Austin, Chris Jericho, Eddie Guerrero and many more had opportunities taken away from them due to the stars making the big bucks which inevitably resulted in then jumping ship to WWF, who were forced into making new stars at the time due to losing the likes of main eventers like Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall to the Ted Turner promotion. This is how the Attitude Era was born. Fans could rally behind the likes of The Rock, Steve Austin, Kane, Mick Foley, star after star after star. But 20 years later, these are still the stars. The problem was once again highlighted at WrestleMania 32 when The Rock made his return and received his pop at the expense of, you guessed it, the Wyatt family. Beating them in six seconds. WWE had become everything that WCW was. The problem in this era though, was there was not much that a held down wrestler could do. Essentially, the Vince McMahon promotion held a monopoly of the wrestling world. They were the new face of fear for fans and workers alike. After WrestleMania 32, Wyatt and his family went into a meaningless feud with another underdeveloped faction known as the League of Nations, and possibly making a switch into becoming people that the fans can finally rally behind. Righteous, but vindicated. However, a calf injury ruled Bray out of action, forcing him to take some time away from our screens. At the time, I couldn't help but feel perhaps a break was needed. You know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. However, when he returned, it was just more of the same. The family were cemented as the perennial bad guys when they took on the beloved New Day. The New Day were essentially a bunch of friends who let their fandom take over, coming out in Power Rangers inspired gear, blasting a trumpet and just seeming like they had a lust for life. Much like the Wyatts though, all members were yet to break that glass seal. So in this feud, everyone had something to prove. It resulted in some fun matches, I enjoyed them, one taking place at the storyline compound of the Wyatts. In the end, the family came out on top, and they seemed to be on the up. Until it was decided, once again, to split the faction up, with Braun Strowman being drafted to Raw, and Rowan and Wyatt finding their home on SmackDown. Having the Wyatts triumph at the detriment of the New Day did nothing for anyone, especially when one plans to split them up anyway. To make matters even more confusing, Wyatt then abandoned Rowan again to go it alone. Bray then focused his attention on Randy Orton, someone who has been around for over a decade, with the two going back and forth before Luke Harper returned from injury to help his brother. Orton then shockingly joined Bray on his crusade, if you can't beat him, join him. Finally, after years and years, it seemed to have work. An enemy of Wyatt was broken. Randy, that you once knew, is dead. Randy furthered his commitment to Bray by sacrificing himself at Survivor Series, eventually leading to both men joining forces to capture the Tag Team Championships. The rivals turned friends angle as one long used by the world of wrestling. However, this had a bit of a twist. Orton, while looking like the prototype for a professional wrestler, has long been touted as cunning and evil, committing shocking acts. However, at this stage of his career, in my opinion, the character had grown incredibly stale. The poster boy of the previously mentioned authority was just twiddling his thumbs come the end of that storyline. So teaming up with Bray gave him an edge and a darkness. Much like how Sting was presented in WCW when he went from a surfer to a crow-inspired look. It also helped Bray look far more powerful with a new member in his flock. Logic. Nice. We want that. To add further to the intrigue, Luke Harper was quite weary of the new sheep. Knowing Orton's history, he manifested concerns to the fans worldwide. When would the Viper strike on the Wyatt family? Or would Luke get through to Bray and both men take Orton out? That's what you want from stories. You want to be left guessing. You want to be left thinking what's going to happen. The alliance actually went on a lot longer than anticipated, with Randy Orton winning the 2017 Royal Rumble. 
as a result of the win, Orton became a two-time Royal Rumble winner. The first was in 2009. And the seventh wrestler to win multiple Royal Rumble matches. I think that's a statistic that kind of speaks for itself. Wyatt was actually in the final four, with many fans, including me, clamouring for the Eaters of Worlds to come out on top. As we all know at this stage, Bray never comes out on top. Would I be made to eat my words, though? It didn't seem like it, because John Cena won his 13th World Championship title at the Rumble, and with Randy Orton being the Royal Rumble winner, would we be treated to the 1,000th match between the pair? It seems certain until Bray's crown a moment. At the Elimination Chamber, an event before WrestleMania, Bray Wyatt defied the odds and defeated John Cena, AJ Styles, The Miz, Dean Ambrose and Baron Corbin to capture the WWE Championship. The patriarch of the family had finally begun the era of Wyatt. This was new and fresh. Over on Raw, a similar story was developing with a young upstart Kevin Owens forming an alliance with a veteran in Chris Jericho. Owens was the Raw champion, known as the Universal Champion, and had developed an interest in feud with Chris Jericho, which many would hope would lead to a defining WrestleMania moment. However, WWE does what WWE does, and had Kevin Owens squashed by Bill Goldberg. Yes, Bill Goldberg, the man that had his peak 19 years earlier, in a different company. Goldberg and Lesnar were now on a collision course for the title at Mania, while Owens and Jericho were relegated to the second match on the card. With Vince McMahon, thoroughly unhappy with the match in itself, as showcased in the behind the scenes footage. It's actually heartbreaking to watch these people trying to please Vince. A stadium of tens of thousands, but an audience of one. The frustrations of fans can be felt in Owen's head drop. These guys built a compelling fresh storyline which one would hope would lead to the next generation of stars, but no. We were force fed a match that we had witnessed 13 years earlier at WrestleMania 20. Surely with failure to anoint a new industry leader on Raw, SmackDown couldn't miss a beat. The inevitable turn happened after Orton previously having vowed not to compete against the new face of fear as long as Wyatt is the master and he is the servant, went back on his word. We had ourselves a battle royal that ended in a draw before Orton changed his mind and defeated AJ Styles to earn the number one contender spot again. Like what was the purpose of the Royal Rumble win? Where's all that logic now? Why would he win the Royal Rumble, give up his spot at WrestleMania, and then change his mind? We just want something coherent. Orton then added fuel to the fire by desecrating Wyatt's sister's grave and burning down his childhood home, which killed Sister Abigail's spirit. Not to be outdone, Wyatt bathed himself in his sister's ashes, purportedly gaining strength from that before Orton stopped all that magic stuff by driving Wyatt's symbol into her gravesite. Oh, for the love of... Do you understand why people think wrestling is stupid? How can we take anything seriously when the hocus pocus stuff is involved? Imagine watching Oppenheimer, and about an hour and a half into that, aliens start descending from the skies for 15 minutes, before just going back to the creation of the atomic bomb and tell the rest of the story. It would be jarring, right? This storyline was jarring, and the match reflected this at Mania. Maggots, worms, crickets all grace the canvas as Bray seemingly mastered the dark art of projection. The crowd were largely silent. Ambivalence and apathy for a well-worked story is not what you want from a crowd. Wyatt failed to defend the title that night, and Orton's 13th World Championship reign began. I didn't care. No one else cared. We were sick of the one guy in the audience ruining the show. This was further heightened by Roman Reigns defeating The Undertaker in the main event. He was clearly WWE's guy. Not Bray, not Owens, but Roman. This is who Vince wanted. The writing was on the wall, fans were fed up. I'd imagine not as fed up as actual fans sitting in an arena watching the House of Horrors match between the two. Bray had challenged Orton to a match in a house that had a magic tractor, baby dolls hanging from the ceiling, and attempted murder when a fridge was thrown on Randy Orton. This all played out much to my bemusement, but imagine how fans felt after paying to witness live wrestling and be treated to this horror show. With Orton seemingly dead, and the announcer showing concern for about 10 seconds. And with Randy Orton lying with a refrigerator on him inside the house of horrors, you have to believe the forfeiture is coming. Wyatt went back to the arena in a limo before shockingly being confronted by a fine Orton in the ring. How did he get there? Doesn't matter. 
Did the fridge nearly kill him? Doesn't matter. Who cares? No explanation was given. Where was the consequences for what had happened? Cartoonish. Long gone are the days when a wrestler was attacked and they'd rub sandpaper on their face to show that what happened actually mattered. Sandman pretended to be blind for a month while in ECW to sell an injury. That dedication has real life effects, which I admit is extreme for a TV show. However, to blatantly not showcase injuries during the actual show itself is insulting. If you don't care, why should we? Wyatt then went on to have feuds with the likes of Seth Rollins and Finn Balor before joining Matt Hardy in a tag team, The Deleter of Worlds. However, after years of disregard for the tag team division in WWE, once again, and I keep saying it, no one cared. A somewhat novel idea with Wyatt finally becoming a good guy, and it was a story that had potential. However, the tag team disbanded due to the powers to be, apparently growing tired of the duo constantly pitching ideas. How can you ever get invested in anything that at the whim of a madman could be thrown on the scrap heap in an instant? During this time, it's important to know that the real-life Wyndham Rotunda was involved in a three-car pile-up which resulted in his hospitalisation. He ultimately and thankfully survived, ominously proclaiming to TMZ, I'm going to live through it because I can't die. Bray Wyatt had unfinished business, a legacy to build, and for the legend of the Wyatt to live on, he needed to go away. Raw was Bray Wyatt's last appearance before exiting our screens with no real rhyme or reason. He was just gone. Allowing us fans to lament what was. It's easy to pinpoint what went wrong when you just glance over what went on. When it was Bray's time, the trigger was never pulled. With me projecting a personal point of view upon Bray, it must have been incredibly frustrating to constantly be on the cusp of greatness, only to be time and time again let down was still trying to maintain the one thing that keeps us all going. Hope. It seemed inevitable a return was going to happen, but in what form would things change? The day after WrestleMania, Wyatt made his comeback to WWE TV. It wasn't the same haunting presence fans remembered. Instead, he appeared as the host of a kid-friendly show known as the Firefly Funhouse. Now, at first glance, that Funhouse seemed harmless, even a bit whimsical, with its bright colors, catchy tunes, do the muscle man dance. But as the weeks went by, it became apparent that there was more lurking beneath the surface. Wyatt's jovial demeanor would often take a sinister turn, hinting at an alter ego lurking within, a dark, more malevolent presence. Once again, nuance. Week after week, I watched with bated breath as Wyatt's alter ego began to manifest. The once jovial host would slip into moments of eerie silence, his eyes gleaming with an unsettling intensity. And then, the moment arrived when the facade shattered, revealing the true nature of Bray Wyatt's twisted duality. He was unleashed. An alter ego was unleashed upon the WWE Universe, a demonic entity known only as The Fiend. With his haunting mask and his unsettling presence, The Fiend could strike fear into the hearts of wrestlers and fans alike, become a force to be reckoned with, Amidst the darkness, there was a lesson to be learned, though. Bray Wyatt's journey from the Firefly Funhouse to the emergence of the Fiend was a testament to the complexity of the human psyche. It showed that even the brightest of facades can hide the darkest of secrets, and that sometimes, that line between light and darkness, it's thinner than we dare to imagine. You want to see my secret? In the world of interconnected cinematic universes, Bray produced Easter eggs foretelling this character years earlier. And in his skin, it was as pale as a pearl. Thin yellow hairs, his eyes were yellow like a cat. That's the type of narrative that can keep fans investing in consuming the product, rewarding us for our diligence. Looking for nuggets of information that make things matter. Over the years, former foes would become tag team partners at the drop of a hat, with the history conveniently forgotten as the story required. And so, The Fiend continues to cast his shadow over the WWE landscape, 
we were left to ponder the true nature of Bray Wyatt and the depths of the darkness that reside within us all. Bray was reborn, emphasized by the fact he carried his own head as a symbol to the ring when he emerged for his first SummerSlam encounter with Finn Balor. In the heart of a packed arena, anticipation crackled through the air like electricity. I could feel it through the TV screen. We all awaited the debut of a character that we had only glimpsed. And I'm sure glad you did. The atmosphere was charged with trepidation and excitement. For tonight, we would come face to face with the fiend in the flesh. As the lights dimmed and a haunting remix of Bray's old theme echoed throughout the arena, we erupted into a frenzy. The fiend emerged carrying a lantern shaped like Bray Wyatt's severed head, cast in an ominous glow. It was a moment that fell straight out of a horror movie, with flashing lights and props adding to the surreal spectacle. Once inside the ring, the fans got their first clear look at the Fiend, and the sight was... it was unlike anything we've seen before. His mask, as horrific as it appeared in the vignette, sent a shudder through the audience. Finn Balor, Wyatt's opponent, stood in shock as his every move just seemed to have no effect on the monstrous figure before him. The Fiend no-souled Balor's offense, displaying a menacing and impactful style. Utilizing the mandible claw further delighting me as I once again drew associations with mankind. The match ended swiftly, the Fiend's effortly dispatching Balor, enhancing his reputation as an unstoppable force. It was a masterful debut. It was class with every element of the character perfected to create an aura of intimidation and invincibility. The crowd were captivated. I was captivated. I was glued to the TV. Believe and I've just witnessed the birth of a truly special attraction within wrestling. Yeah, it was at the expense of my fellow Irishman Finn Balor, but he went on to have a run in NXT, where he became a bad guy. You know why he became a bad guy? Because the fiend allowed him to access the darkness within his soul. How cool is that? And as cool as this character could be, and the many little offshoots and branches that I could spring from just interacting with the fiend, what followed his debut tarnished the brilliance. WWE's decision to rush Wyatt into the universal title scene, disregarding the careful build-up that made him feel special, I genuinely had my head in my hands when I heard this. Why would such a character care for such material things? I have to say I wasn't best pleased. I had that feeling in the pit of my stomach once again. They were going to mess it up and what followed can only be regarded as a tragedy. All right, let's get to it. The infamous Hell in a Cell against Seth Rollins. That will probably go down as one of the biggest missteps in professional wrestling history. The arena was drenched in red lighting, once again adding an unnecessary element to the character. You see, The Fiend is undoubtedly more scary when operating in our real world, not their storyline world. Monsters living among us. Wyatt took everything Rollins had before the match was over by disqualification. It was such typical WWE. They did the same when it was Sabu versus Rey Mysterio at One Night Stand 2. They just booked themselves into a corner, failed to commit, and I felt cheated. Wyatt's character, after just over a month of debuting, was inexplicably humanized, castrated, I would say. And WWE rightfully faced chance from their own fan base shouting the initials of the rival promotion, AEW. Subsequent poor booking decisions from overly spooky shenanigans to being squashed by Goldberg, a common theme, turned the fiend from menacing presence into a caricature of his former self. It was a baffling, descent when you think about the heights of his debut, leaving fans lamenting once again what could have been. It seemed unlikely that the missteps of the Fiend's booking would ever be rectified. What began as a promising and perfect beginning devolved into a cautionary tale of how even the most compelling characters can be mishandled with disastrous consequences. And then we move on to WrestleMania 36, which carved out a chapter unlike any other. Amidst the backdrop of the global pandemic, WWE's grandest event unfolded in front of empty seats. A match that defied all expectations and blurred all the lines between reality and fantasy occurred. It was the Firefly Funhouse match between John Cena and Bray Wyatt. This was originally slated for a conventional showdown inside the ring. Circumstances, of course, dictated a departure from tradition. And I remember there was three people in one of the conference rooms in NXT with me. I said, what's a Firefly Funhouse? <laughs> he said, I don't know. I said, great. 
You see, as John Cena made his entrance into the deserted WWE Performance Center, he found himself thrust into the surreal realm of the Firefly Funhouse. Through a door that seemingly led to the depths of his own psyche, Cena embarked on a journey through the corridors of his own career, encountering echoes of his past, present, and potential futures. Bray was the orchestrator of Cena's odyssey, guiding him through a maze of his own memories and mirages. Puppets played their role, adding a layer of surrealism. It wasn't a wrestling match, it was more an excursion into recesses of John Cena's consciousness. How can anyone take a brawl like Brock Lesnar and Drew McIntyre seriously when this stuff was going on? I know it received plaudits for its innovation, but in my opinion, the shark was jumped at this point. From here, it was all downhill for Bray and The Fiend, with certain stars apparently not wanting to be involved with the circus. He went up against his former family member Braun Strowman in another gimmick match. Alexa Bliss came under his spell before locking up once again with his former nemesis, Randy Orton, who proceeded to set The Fiend on fire before he returned looking like, well, this. I know that might seem like we were skipping over a lot, but it was for with good reason. Wyatt once again lost in the final match of the few, putting his record at WrestleMania's 4-1. Now, we talked about The Undertaker. Compare that to his record at WrestleMania. He won 21 times before he lost one. That's how you build a character. That's how you build a legacy. Over his whole career, Undertaker won 72% of all his matches, right? Bray lost 64%. Mm. He lost 64%. He won 33%. At the end of the day, whatever you think about Wyatt and his creative work and the missteps, he was never given the ball to run with. And eventually, he was gone out of the game altogether. Wyndham Rotunda was fired in July of 2021. Bray Wyatt was a cherished figure. He was the very essence of a homegrown talent, his roots deeply intertwined with the WWE. I got to watch him transform a metamorphosis playing out on my screen. From his debut as Husky Harris in 2010 to his enigmatic reimaginings. In his next debut, Bray told us we would understand, yet we never did. Trying to figure this man out over a near decade long performance, seeing him grow, seeing him change, yet still trying to connect the dots to what he was. And now he was gone. His essence remained elusive. Now speculation in the real world ran rampant as to his next steps. Would he seek solace in the embrace of another promotion, like the one that was chanted in Hell in a Cell, AEW? Wrestling coursed through his veins, a legacy passed down from generations before him. His grandfather was Black Jack Mulligan, his father IRS, his brother was Bo Dallas, his uncle Barry Windham. So where does one venture after crafting a legacy within the realm of professional wrestling? We wait. Surprisingly, an upheaval occurred in 2022. Seismic shifts, some would say, reverberating throughout the wrestling world. Vince McMahon's fall from grace. That paved the way for Triple H to helm the WWE's creative direction, offering a glimmer of hope for those cast aside by the old regime. Could Bray find his way back? In the lead up to WWE Extreme Rules, whispers of a mysterious presence began to circulate. The White Rabbit. And maybe you go chasing rabbits. Cryptic clues throughout the program and beckoned faithful like me to seek out little nuggets of information to get me invested, to make me feel like what I'm seeing matters. Every little pixel. As the curtain fell on WWE Extreme Rules, the veil was lifted to reveal none other than Bray Wyatt, accompanied by his entourage from the Firefly Funhouse. I watched it at home and I could hear the crowd erupting in a symphony of emotion embracing this return. With each passing home, Bray's presence grew, his words resonating with an authenticity we've long yearned for. Yet amidst the resurgence, a new adversary emerged in the form of Uncle Howdy. Once again, mystery and intrigue, menace. Uncle Howdy's present loomed large, a 
specter of uncertainty haunting Bray's path, but in a twist of fate it was suspected that behind the mask lay Bray's own flesh and blood, his brother, Bo Dallas. A revelation that only deepened the intrigue surrounding it. Were we going to see Bray and his brother be the new brothers of destruction? Were we going to finally get new family members? As the sands of time shifted into 2023, Bray Wyatt stood poised on the precipice of greatness, his alliance with Uncle Howdy marking a new chapter in his storied career. Yet, fate had other plans. An illness cast a shadow over his aspirations, dimming the light of WrestleMania's grand stage. In his final appearance on WWE television, Bray Wyatt stood tall alongside his brother as the crowd chanted, Thank you, Bray. <laughs> Months passed and I was itching to see Bray on the screen once again, not knowing the full extent of his illness. It was rumored that he was due back soon to carry on this story. I kind of feel bad now because Vince McMahon had returned at this time too and I selfishly thought once again he is just going to ruin my enjoyment of Bray Wyatt and the product. I was misguided. Wrestling is a story. You can get lost in that story sometimes. You forget about the real world implications. While the wrestling world was reeling from the loss of a legend of Terry Funk, myself included, on the 23rd of August, I received a WhatsApp message from a friend that woke me up. It was like 3 a.m. in the morning, and it just simply stated, Bray Wyatt has died. According to accounts detailed in law enforcement records, Wyndham lay in a slumber in his home before suffering a heart attack. And it was his fiance, Jojo, who discovered Wyndham motionless in their bed. I think obviously the people aren't ready to see someone like me yet. At the age of 36, Wyndham Rotunda's legacy has firmly been etched into wrestling history. That's undeniable. I've had the pleasure to witness a man dedicated to his craft to try and present something different, dare to defy the conventions of professional wrestling. Sure, not everything worked out on screen, but sure, that's the joys of creating art, isn't it? It's why wrestling is awesome, to be honest. Every single week, you know new wrestling will be there, and what might show up may shock you, embarrass you, upset you, make you laugh, make you cry, and Wyndham was a master of this, man. No matter what he did, we remember. He was the color of red. In a world full of black and white. And though he may no longer walk among us, the spirit of Wyndham Rotunda lives on in the hearts of those that dare to dream alongside him. Forever reminding us that the biggest risk in life is not taking any at all. Stay safe. Stay sane. Run. <laughs>